So as Dr. King just said, my name is Ashley Rober and I'm working in the psychology department with Dr. Niergarter. And the title of my research project is Parkinson's disease and the clock drawing test. Does type of initial symptom affect visual, spatial, and planning abilities? I just wanted to give a brief introduction to Parkinson's disease. Um, first, I just wanted to let you know that it does affect 1% of the world population. 1% doesn't sound that big. When you really look at the numbers, that's 4 to 6 million people. So it is quite a few people that are affected. Uh, symptoms usually begin in the mid-50s. However, there are some people that have earlier symptoms. Um, a famous person being Michael J. Fox, that a lot of people know of. And these people are referred to as having early onset. Uh, Parkinson's disease, which I'll refer to as PD from now on. There are currently no blood tests to diagnose PD, so doctors rely on neurological examinations and medical history. There are two groups of motor symptoms relevant to PD. Those are tremor and non-tremor, which I will break up in a few minutes. Um, and the causes of PD at this point are gener generally unknown. There has been a link between high exposure to certain types of pesticides and a very small portion of PD cases where those pesticides were frequently used, um, a lot of farming communities especially. The neuropathology of Parkinson's disease is basically what, to break this picture down a little bit because this will explain it easiest, uh, if you look in the center, but <laughs> the picture shows you how it's cut. It's a, it's a section that's cut through here, and it's the black and white on the left bottom corner is what you would be looking if you were looking down on the head. And off to the right side of the screen, there's pictures of a certain area known as the substantia nigra. And Parkinson's disease is due to the fact that there is a lack of, or a depletion of a, an important neurotransmitter known as dopamine in this area, the substantia nigra, and the picture on the top is showing you a healthy substantia nigra, the picture on the bottom is showing you what it looks like after the dopamine has been depleted, and as you can see, it's significantly lighter. That will help. <laughs> if I can find it, I was trying to find it. Um, there we go. <laughs> um, so like I said, there are two types of motor impairments, or motor disorders within symptoms within Parkinson's disease. There's the tremor and there's the non-tremor. The tremor usually starts, um, I shouldn't say usually, sometimes starts within the hand. That's what most people think of, I think. It can also start in other areas of the body, um, legs, arms, etc. And it can start on either side of the body. Non-motor symptoms, there's a variety. The most common ones are bradykinesia, which is a very small rigid movement, uh, there can be freezing, where people literally freeze up and can't move either their whole body or part of their body. Um, there's postural instability, which is becoming a problem, with a lot, or becomes a problem with a lot of PD patients because they tend to fall a lot and get hurt. And these motor impairments are due to a the lack of dopamine traveling from the substantia nigra, which is what I showed you in the last slide. It's also shown in this picture right here, This area right in here, and the dopamine travels up to the corpus striatum, which is made of two parts, the caudate nucleus and the putamen, which are located these brown areas in the middle here. What is not as well known about Parkinson's disease are the cognitive impairments that are involved. Uh, this is due to a dopamine depletion in the prefrontal cortex, which is this purple area in the front here that's labeled number three and possibly the posterior parietal cortex, which is the purple area in the, towards the back, labeled number eight. These cognitive impairments can consist of visual-spatial problems. Um, this is spatial relations among objects, so for instance, depth perception or mentally rotating an object in your brain. Um, executive functioning problems, which are related to planning and organizing, and memory functioning as well. It has been shown that non-tremor Parkinson's patients typically have more frontal lobe deficits, which are the deficits of um, the executive functioning and a lot of the memory deficits. 
than tremor patients do. However, it is currently unclear whether tremor and non-tremor patients show dif differential deficits when examining additional areas of the brain, such as the parietal lobe. In the present study, we examined this by administering the clock drawing test, which is a neuropsychological assessment that allowed us to measure both frontal and parietal lobe functioning in tremor and non-tremor patients, as well as controls. Um, just a Brief rundown, our participants consisted of 24 controls, 13 tremor Parkinson's patients, and 11 non-tremor Parkinson onset patients. They were matched for age, education, male to female ratio, and their scores on the mini mental status examination, or state examination. Um, the tremor and non-tremor were also matched on their Hone and Yar scale, which is a measure of motor ability and um, the duration that they had the disease, which found people mainly, as you can see, the averages are under um, a score of two, which is still pretty low. I think the highest we had was a three, and it goes up to five, which is severe on the one in our scale. And that was because we didn't want them to not be able to physically draw a clock, because that, as you'll see, is necessary for this test. So the clock drawing test, um, basically what we do, we give them a sheet of plain white paper and we tell them to, we say, I would like you to draw a clock, including the numbers, and set the hands to 10 after 11. Uh, this, I'll get into more detail in a minute, but this does break up, um, separates the frontal and the visual spatial, or excuse me, frontal and parietal functioning um, because of the fact that it, well, I guess I'll get into it, but it looks more at, um, here we go, <laughs> at different portions of the clock, and the numbers in particular is what we're really focusing on. They have to draw a face, they have to draw the numbers, they have to draw the hands. The visual spatial part of it, which is the parietal part, is looking at how they space out their numbers and if they're in the correct order, if they, you know, are inside of the clock versus outside, things like that. Um, so that was the rule of method of scoring, and then that's just the aftermath, so the final product is scored. But we also, unlike many people who've done clock drawing tests with Parkinson's patients, do something called the Boston Process Approach, which looks at the process of drawing the clock, and it looks at the, particularly the order of, in which they draw the numbers. Um, there were two main groups, planned and unplanned, and within that, the planned group had sequential, sequential and anchor sequential as possibilities. Sequential starts at the number 12 from the top of the clock and goes around straight up to number 11 in order. Anchor sequential is when you have your major uh, 12, 3, 6, and 9, and then you fill in the numbers in between to, for nice even spacing. And then random is anything that does not fit into those two categories. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that we did test frontal lobe functioning of all three groups of patients or participants because we wanted to make sure that, uh, well, we want to see how those correlate with each other, their clock drawing test scores and their frontal lobe score, test scores. So the first set of tests we gave them was called the FAS and the animals test. These, like I said, are tests of frontal lobe functions and they specifically look at, look at planning and organizing abilities. Um, out of brief rundown, FAS is we have them list all the words they can think of beginning with the letters F, then A, then S, and then animals, we have them list any animals that they can think of. And the reason this looks at planning and organizing is because, for instance, we only use the letter F, we didn't use F, A, and S. So what that looks at is do they think to do them in FAs, then FEs, etc., or do they just sporadically come up with whatever F words they can think of, which could be amazing. <laughs> Um, <laughs> animals are a little bit more, I think, naturally come to people a little bit more organized because you think of, okay, farm animals, ocean animals, et cetera, et cetera. But not everybody does. We also use the digits pan forward and backward tests. Uh, this is frontal lobe tests as well. It is a test of short-term memory, attention, and concentration. And basically, uh, the forward is the subject must repeat three to nine digits forward that we give them, and then backward is two to nine digits backwards. So, 
it's kind of spelled self-explanatory, but. And our results. Um, for the Rouleau method of the clock drawing task, the, that was the final product. The only real difference we noticed was in the numbers portion, which is actually awesome for what we were looking for. Uh, we noticed that the normal controls and the non-tremor patients had the biggest difference in their number <coughs> scores. So controls having the best or highest scores and non-tremor having the lowest scores. In terms of the Boston process approach, I'm going to break it up into two pieces. First we'll do controls versus PDs in general. Uh, the PDs were just under significantly more likely to use a random technique than the controls. Um, as you can see, the majority of, or just under the majority of controls, use the sequential method, which, like I said, is a planned method. And 75% of them use one of the two planned methods. And then I broke up the Parkinson's patients into the two groups, the tremor and non-tremor. And once again, it was just under being significant, but um, the tremor showed, it looked significant, when you look at it to me at least, but not according to statistics. So um, tremor, 54% <laughs> of the tremor participants use a random technique in their number drawing, and only 27% of the non-tremor use a random technique. And this one was really, really close in terms of significance. It was 0.07 in maybe 0.05 or better. Um, in terms of that, we think if we just had a bigger sample size to work with, which we will hopefully do in the future, we'll have significance. So a few more people. For the frontal lobe tests, we noted significance within every test except for the animals, which um, there was pretty similar results on. Um, in terms of the F test from the FAS test, uh, there was a major difference between controls and tremor participants. In digits span forward, it was the same. In digits span backwards, it was the control and tremor, as well as tremor and non-tremor. So, just sum that all up and make sense of it. Uh, Basically, our results indicate that the non-tremor group was more likely than the tremor group to use planning on the clock drawing test, which we were kind of surprised by at first. However, they also received lower scores on the numbers portion of this test. Together, these findings suggest that the non-tremor group had visual spatial deficits in addition to the widely known frontal lobe deficits. These visual spatial deficits were not evident in the tremor group. We also found that the tremor group performed significantly worse than the normal control group on three out of four of the frontal lobe tests, which I said was quite surprising, because this is the opposite of what previous research suggests. The non-tremor group typically displays more frontal lobe deficits. We are currently working on figuring out why this happened. 